Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian here at the Air Force Association's annual Air, Space, and Cyber Conference and Trade Show at the Gaylord National Harbor outside Washington, D.C., largest gathering of U.S. Air Force leaders from around the world to talk about the services, future strategy, and technologies. Our coverage here is sponsored by Elbit Systems of America, L3 Technologies, and Leonardo DRS. And we're positively honored to have with us General Marianne Miller, who is uh, the new uh, commander of the U.S. Air Force's Air Mobility Command, uh, 10 days uh, on the job. Ma'am, thanks so very much for taking time to, to talk to us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Um, so, uh, mes message from the chief has been, you know, this is a time of great power competition. A uh, lot of discussion on uh, from the secretary on what the end strength increases uh, mean. Uh, 74 or so more squadrons are going to be needed for the U.S. Air Force above the 312 the service has now. Um, as you shift to a great power competition model, um, I know your predecessor Dewey Everhard was working on uh, increasing the capability of, of AMC to be able to operate uh, from contested bases on short notice over vast areas. Talk to us a little bit about your priorities now as you're uh, you know, uh, a couple of weeks into the job mm -hmm. uh, and, and how you're going to continue that evolution mm -hmm. to get AMC uh, uh, primed and ready for great power competition because sometimes folks focus on the pointy end side of it not all the tankers and lifters that make the, you know, the, it's, it's core to the ability of the force to project power. Mm. Yeah, the priorities for the Air Mobility Command are evolve around the contested environment. So really it's rapid global mobility, uh, the ability to move at the speed of war and able to, uh, and ensure that we can achieve our mobility objectives in a contested environment, degraded environment, or operationally limited environment. So that, that will be the focus. We'll do that through continued emphasis on readiness and how do we operate through those environments and what do we ready, how do we ready, ensure that we fully ready our airmen to be able to operate in those environments. We'll also look at course at force development. What's the mobility airmen of the future look like based on the threats of the future? So we will look at those aspects of it. We always have to maintain our, um, our assurity in the nuclear, our support of the nuclear, um, uh, the nuclear enterprise, and we do that on a day-to-day -day basis through our tactics, tactic, uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures, and uh, it, it's second nature to us as we move along through that. Uh, the biggest focus, as I said, is moving through um, that contested environment and how best do we do that. Uh, through our enriched structure, what do our bases need to look like in order to operate in that environment? Uh, our crews, are they prepared? And our MDSs, our weapon systems, how best are they prepared to operate in that, in that environment? Whether it be a, a, a cyber threat, whether it be a threat to our um, survivability of our aircraft, whether it be a, a threat to the base. How do we best prepare ourselves to be able to operate in that? The threat changes every day. So what do we need to do to stay ahead of that? We need to be agile and resilient in our response to that. Innovation is key to that. Our airmen will be uh, focusing much more on not innovation for innovation's sake, but innovation to be uh, resilient and agile in that environment that we know is out there and that is changing every day and how do we stay ahead of it. So our airmen will be key to our success in how we do this. Taking care of our families is critical to the support. You know, we recruit airmen, but we retain the family, and we will focus much more on that. So a broad range of priorities, uh, all focused on being able to operate in that environment, that, that threat environment, and how do we best support our airmen to, to achieve the objectives that we have to. Um, let me take you uh, to the question of added size. Um, the secretary outlined plans to grow bigger. What are the kind of airlift uh, squadron growth that you need uh, to see on, on your side of the equation? So based on the current results uh, that we have so far uh, from the analysis done to date, there will be uh, a requirement potentially for 14 additional tanker squadrons and one additional airlift squadron. There will be, as the secretary stated yesterday, other studies that will support and underpin that analysis. Uh, MCRS being one of them, the mobility capability um, study that uh, requirement study that is ongoing right now between CAPE and Transcom, led by Transcom, supported from the half, supported by the analysis of Air Mobility Command. So we will continue to look at these studies as they roll out. The focus right now, is the, as the Secretary said, is trying to understand uh, the force that we need for the environment that we're going to be expected to, to compete in and win in. And that's what the focus is. It's about uh, bringing all this conversation to light and to, and to begin the deep dive conversations on, on what's really needed uh, and then taking that message to Congress and, and working with them. 
Um, let me uh, take you to an aging airlift fleet. Um, I remember when the C, you know, I, I remember uh, a very fond times with the C-141 uh, when uh, I used to cover uh, the Air Force very closely in the Mobility Command when it was first born. I remember when it was stood up uh, and the entry of the C-17 into service. Uh, now it's hard to imagine the C-17 is uh, getting long in the tooth, fantastic airplane, uh, but you know, very high utilization rates that have been put on it. Mm -hmm. uh, the tanker force, uh, you know, I, I remember KC-135R, the re-engineing, Pacer Craig, all of that, and now that's a long time in the past. And Tinker is working very, very hard to keep those airplanes up and running as the KC-46 comes online. Talk to us a little bit about an aging force, because these recapitalization rates will be slow, your utilization rates will be high, and in a couple of years, that's going to be a real challenge. Talk to us a little bit about how you're doing the whole fleet-wide management equation to ensure that you can you know, stretch these out as, as you begin to think, plan, and then start acquiring replacements for the future. Yeah, as we deal with these legacy um, weapon systems, uh, the structures that we have put in place, the, the, the depots, um, the engineering behind Air, Mobility, or Air Force Material Command, everything that we have, the structure um, is very robust because it has to be in order to keep these weapon systems moving into our future. When you specifically look at the, at the C-17, uh, we're making modifications to that airplane to keep it in the inventory for a long time. Uh, it's 22 years old, but I tell you what, it's an amazing airframe. And we will continue to modify it. We're putting a new HUD in it. Uh, we're looking at uh, secure line of sight um, as far as capabilities for communication. So we will take each weapon system and how do we best modify it for the future? That's our goal. Are we going to have funding for a new airlifter in the near future? No. Uh, will we build it into the plan? We will look at where would we put that in the future. Not sure. I'm day 10 in the job. <laughs> <laughs> so we will, but we will take each weapon system and, and look at the in-depth analysis of that, what the future threat is going to be out there, and then how do we best, um, you know, build a, build the requirements that would lead us into the future to make, make us successful. When is that in the program, and, and when would we try to lay that in? I couldn't tell you right now. But right now, it's not, it's not in the forefront of my mind right now. Um, uh, that, uh, that precludes a couple of questions which I was going to ask okay. you about that. So we can uh, move to sure. KC-46. Uh, uh, a lot of anticipation. Uh, we talked to General Sharpie earlier this year, uh, and I think that everybody's expressed a little bit of frustration at the delays of the airplane uh, getting into service um, to replace the KC-135s. Uh, now there appears to be a, yet a couple of other certification challenges. Talk to us a little bit from your standpoint. Uh, you know, are these showstoppers, uh, you know, how much of a delay is going to, uh, is, is this going to put to the program? And when do you start getting these airplanes on the ramp? Yeah, the Cat 1 deficiencies, you know, is centering around the remote visual system uh, and centering around the, the boom performance right now. Uh, the uh, program office will work with Boeing through all of these. Our focus right now and my focus right now is, is Air Mobility Command ready to accept the aircraft? Uh, and we are. And we'll let We'll let the program office work with Boeing on how, we, uh, on how we work through those deficiencies right now. So my focus is really on being prepared. Uh, we are excited about getting that airframe. It provides a capability that will just extend us uh, in being able to support the fighters and the other, other providers that we, that, we, um, that we help throughout the fight. So really looking forward to bringing that airplane online. Uh, I can uh, I can o only only imagine uh, in terms of the capability the jet is going to bring the force, um, but when you look at modernization rates, those are going to be entering service at 15 a year. Um, that means it's going to take a dozen years just for 179 airplanes, and you have almost 390 something. I don't know what the number is, but I'm going off memory for KC-135s that will need replacing uh, ultimately. And those were delivered in 10 years between 1955 and 65, if I recall, and 800 jets were delivered. Mm -hmm. um, do we need to more seriously consider the speed with which we modify the lift and mobility forces, given that they are so critical to our ability to be, be able to project power anywhere in the world? I think the program uh, the plan that we have, given the program we have in our defense budget, I think it's, it's the best that we can do right now. We're restricted by the budget, uh, and we've put the best plan in place to deliver a capability and to provide that recapitalization rate um, to keep the 135 in the inventory as long as we can as those new, as the KC-46 comes on. We're all about, right now, currently keeping that 455 tanker fleet up and running. 
when we have uh, delivered all of the KC-46s, we will be at 479. So, you know, I focus on day-to-day. -day. Um, the plan that is put in place is a good plan given the budget we have. And uh, we will make it as successful as possible and keep, keep the warfighter in the air. Um, let me uh, ask you, you know, when you started your uh, career uh, out of uh, OSU, uh, you flew uh, T-37s, but then you were flying the 141. And uh, a lot of the mission of the plane was to be able, and the U.S. Air Force was going to uh, fight supply uh, to the front edge, mobile in a contested environment. It was very much the, the thinking of, of the leadership. As you're looking at reconstituting some of those skills, because there were a lot of folks on the rank and file who've not had to worry about that at all. It was actually operating off of, uh, in uncontested airspace largely, uh, and, and gave everybody, I think, a, a good comfort feeling, but now is gearing up. How far along do you think you are, and how much farther do you have to go to rebuild the culture, the thinking that, you know, I've got to, you know, do engine running offloads. I've got to be able to, you know, drop cargo off and move. As you were saying, you know, how do I completely change how I do this to keep your adversary off guard uh, while at the same time trying to deliver the message? How far along do you think you are in that process and how much farther do you have to go? Over the last year, we've made tremendous progress. We've, uh, We've created white space for our units in order to train, in order to get after what that full spectrum readiness that we require every day. Uh, we haven't had time uh, previous to this to be able to do that. Uh, with additional money that we received from Congress, we were able to take that money and apply it to the readiness that we need. So we have made great progress in a year. And the Secretary talked about that yesterday in her speech. We've made great progress uh, due to the help of Congress. Uh, and we will continue to make that progress. And we will continue to look at the contested environment, the threats that are out there and evolving every day. And as I said before, what does that mobility airmen need to look like for the future? What are the threats that they will face? And we will build that into the training plan. We will build it into our resiliency and our enrich structure. We'll build it into our AOC. We'll build it into our airmen and what they need. And we'll build it into our weapon systems to be able to operate. Um, let me take you to the pilot uh, shortage issue. Um, when uh, General Everhard and I would talk, you know, at first it was a fighter issue, uh, and he said, well, you know, we look pretty good at AMC, and then after a little while, each time we would talk, it, would, it was looking a little bit less good at AMC, uh, and I think folks still focus on the pointy end of it. Talk to us a little bit from a mobility command standpoint. What's your shortfall? Historically, that's been the place where airlines have gone because you guys have multi-engine, uh, obviously, aircraft. Uh, talk to us where you are, and talk to us also about the approach that you're bringing as part of the Air Force leadership to figure out an institutional solution to a challenge because we've seen an unprecedented boom in air travel. It's the biggest, I think some people say, since the founding of air travel and a generational rotation out of pilots. So it's an insatiable global demand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think when you, uh, when you look at where we are as an Air Force, that, that, that pull from the airlines on our pilots is, is gonna be there for the foreseeable future. They need 4,000 a year. They're going to keep pulling on us to get that. Uh, we as an Air Force have taken tremendous strides to be able to look at the enterprise and say, what is going to make a difference? Uh, it's ops tempo, right? We're not going to increase or decrease our participation in the fight. We're not to create white space. But what are we going to do? We're, when they come home, when the pilots and, and air crew members come home, we're going to try to build white space when they're at home. That will help. We'll try to work with the families to accommodate assignments. That will help. So it's really the quality of service, quality of life aspects that we're going after. We can't compete with the money the airlines pays airline pilots. We can't. But what we can do is look at the value of, a, a value of service and the value of contribution that our airmen give to this country. So as I go around and make my visits to the airfields and talk to our airmen and put my arm around them, it's going to be, you can't do this on the outside. The only place you can do this is we're in the inside. So stay with us. Stay with us. If you make a family decision to leave the active component, please affiliate with the Guard and Reserve. We need every airman. And as we say here in the AFA, we need every airman for life. Wow, uh, General Spencer is going to like that uh, that <laughs> message. You know, we should put the banner for uh, where you can register for airmen uh, for life, uh, which is a tremendous initiative. Um, I want to ask you, um, in terms of uh, what, what can you learn and what can the Mobility Command learn from, for example, major airlines. I know that you've, the Mobility Command always, in part because of the craft 
uh, you know, that's something that you monitor in terms of capability in the airlines that participate in that sort of civil reserve air fleet uh, capacity. But what are some things that the service can learn from airlines, from the Lufthansa's of the world that do large global freight to the United's of the world, in terms of making more efficient your operation to create maybe a little bit more white space that you may have to be able to contribute something else? And they have one more follow-up for you. Okay. We collaborate with the airlines all the time. Um, and it's, it's all about the system and the structure and how they can support us through craft. And then how can we work together to be more efficient? And uh, annually we, we meet, uh, and on a quarterly basis there are working group levels that meet. So uh, I can remember when I was back as a major, and uh, General McNabb, right, Air Mobility Command Commander, uh, he spent a lot of time with the airlines back then and, and making those, uh, those solid connections that we've just kept over the years, over the decades. And, uh, and it's, it's absolutely invaluable to the way we proceed. Uh, and if we would ever go full mobilization, that craft is going to be critical to what we do. So we, we look at efficiencies all the time, transportation to transportation, no matter if it's in the uniform or on the civilian side. Uh, let me ask uh, two quick questions. If you were going to have your dream airlifter, what would it look like as somebody who's got all of this mm -hmm. experience, you've spent your entire uh, time in the community? Mm -hmm. You know, the C-17 is a tremendous airplane. Mm -hmm. I um, mean, it's going to go down in history as one of the best uh, airlift aircraft ever. Mm -hmm. But it was designed for a specific mission, basically to take an M1 tank and put it, you know, under fire on a battlefield on, on an unprepared field. Mm -hmm. Tremendously ambitious requirement. But if you were looking for what challenges are coming down the pike, mm -hmm. what is the kind of airplane that you think the Air Force needs to start thinking about in mm -hmm. terms of whether it's range or for payload mm -hmm. or for any of the other capabilities that you think it needs? The requirements would be based on the threat. So survivability is the key to that. So. Um, the signature the aircraft gives off in an environment is important. So we will look at the signature. Uh, the ability to have defensive systems, that's going to be key. Uh, countermeasures, I think that's going to be key. So it really is looking at the threat and to be able to, to build a, a weapon system that can really counter all those, or if not defeat them, right, work through them, you know, understand you're under attack, be able to, to recognize the threat that's out there and to be able to work through that to achieve your objective. So it's, it's re really going to be evolving as the requirements evolve. That's why agile and resilient is the way we need to be. Last question. Uh, you flew the C-141, mm -hmm. uh, legendary airplane, world's first strategic uh, jet uh, transport, uh, lovely uh, airplane, uh, and uh, you're the first woman to be the Air Mobility Command commander. You know, what was it like to fly the 141, and especially to be in that first generation of, of female pilots who were right. getting into what was sort of an all-male preserve at the time? Yeah, it's all about flying airplanes. <laughs> it's all about flying airplanes. Uh, whether beaver float planes or anything else. Whether float planes for Washington State Department of Fisheries or uh, C-141s or uh, actually I've flown every, every weapon system in air mobility except for the KC-135 and the 130. So I've got two to go, right? Uh, but the and get qualified on the 46A, right? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's just, it's an honor to be in air mobility command. It's an honor to, uh, to be able to serve with the amazing airmen that we do. I look forward to getting out there and put my arms around the maintainers and, and the enlisted air crew and say, hey, we've been talking about the pilot shortage for so long. You know what? Let's have a dialogue to make sure we're heading in the right direction as an air crew force, as a support force for that, for that fighting weapon system on that ramp, whatever that may be. So thank you. Thanks very much, ma'am. And look forward to getting your reminiscences on 141s. And I'll even dig out some old pictures. Yes, we can do that. That's awesome. Thanks very much, ma'am. Thank you.